Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to United Way's STEMcation Week. That's STEM for April Vacation Week. My name is Bob Giannino. I am Anson President and CEO of United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley. And I'm honored to be here uh, with all of you this afternoon. You know, when I was in middle school, I got involved in science fairs. I was lucky that a number of teachers in my hometown of Somerville, not too far from here, were very involved in running regional and state science fairs in Massachusetts. I started competing in seventh grade. And for the next six years, my love and appreciation for science grew and grew. But what also grew was my understanding of the world around me and the many different people, perspectives, and opportunities that existed for me. I also got to meet and know so many people, new people, from outside of my hometown where my family didn't really stray too far from. Meeting new people, many of whom came from different countries and cultures, gave me a whole new perspective on the world around me. So not only were science fairs the early spark for my appreciation of science, they served as the conduit for me in building passion for difference. People different from me, ways of thinking different than mine, and cultures different than those in my immediate community and surroundings. And while this may be my first time at this event, I know many of you have joined us in the past for the STEM breakfast. And we're delighted to have you back with us virtually for the second year in a row. I also wanna give a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us for their first time in support of BOSTEM. We hope you'll all enjoy spending the next half hour or so with us, diving into how we can make headway in diversifying our STEM workforce through programs like BOSTEM and the work you do in your own companies and in your communities. This kind of change wouldn't be possible without all of you and your support. So thank you for being a part of that important and great work and in, as well as part of today's event. I wanna be sure to thank a few of our special partners. Boston After School and Beyond, the Boston Public Schools, and the US Department of Education. And I also wanna thank our sponsors and supporting partners. And finally, I wanna thank the STEM Leadership Committee. The work that you do, the leadership and financial support you provide is crucial to our ability to create positive lasting change. We could not do that work without you. This really is a team effort. Boston bridges the gap between access and opportunity. And by partnering with corporations, schools, and community-based organizations, Boston programs deliver industry-partnered STEM learning opportunities to students and teachers alike. This is how we are developing a talent pipeline in communities with a long history of inequitable access to STEM education. And I think this video does a great job of illustrating that. The city of Boston is a global hub of technology and innovation, but many Boston students lack equitable access to rewarding STEM careers. Only 4% of engineers today are black, and this is not for a lack of interest or talent. The pipeline connecting students of color to high quality opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and math is leaking. United Way is addressing this gap through BOSTEM, a citywide initiative that connects students in Boston public schools to vibrant, hands-on learning experiences that open their eyes to the possibilities available to them in STEM. BOSTEM mobilizes a network of out-of-school time programs community institutions, and industry professionals to prepare Boston youth to enter thriving STEM careers. Through these partnerships, Boston reaches approximately 2,000 students each year, supplementing the learning that happens during school hours with enriching programming, site visits, and connection to STEM professionals. None of this would be possible without our corporate volunteers and partners. These companies also open their doors to Boston educators 
through externships, a professional development opportunity that provides an insider view of what it means to work in these fields. Importantly, Boss STEM shows results. Participating students report significant increases in engagement and career knowledge in these subjects, as well as key social emotional skills. Now, the pandemic has deepened the systemic inequalities that disproportionately impact students of color. It will take all of us to expand access to STEM learning opportunities for underrepresented students across Boston and beyond. No one sector can do it alone, and Boston STEM needs additional support and partnerships to build a more diverse and equitable STEM career pipeline. Join us in advancing equity in STEM industries by investing in Boston students for the workforce opportunities of tomorrow. We do hope that you will join us in this great work Boston STEM is doing to expand beyond middle school to offer STEM opportunities to all Boston students from kindergarten through grade 12. Along with our partners, we're uniting communities to provide career inspiring STEAM opportunities to all underrepresented students. You'll notice I said STEAM instead of STEM, and that's intentional. We believe that art can be a pathway to STEM and wanna take the lead in encouraging existing arts programs to incorporate STEM into their curricula. All of this means we still have thousands of young people to reach. So if you are moved and are able to, please click that donate button on the upper right hand corner of your screen and give what you can to ensure that all of our students have the opportunity to see themselves in STEM and see themselves in you. That brings us to why we're here today. We know that introducing kids to STEM careers early can put them on a path to success in college and career. We also know that the STEM industry is missing out on a tremendous talent pool in our city. And in order to tap it, we need to provide more diverse representation to help kids see themselves in STEM. This is the only way STEM will continue to be a thriving economic engine for our city and for our region. Imagine being a Black or Latinx student returning to school now, knowing that the rate of positive COVID-19 cases in those demographics is three times higher than the rate among white residents in our area. Imagine the fear and distraction they face. Then imagine the security that the Boston STEM out of school time programs provide for those students. Places like West End House or Courageous Sailing and City Sprouts created spaces for these students to learn and develop in safe environments throughout the pandemic. Places where their love of science, technology, engineering, art, and math is celebrated and encouraged. Places where the stress of everyday life can melt away into the joy of a chemistry project or a cool line of a code. Places that inspire a lifelong love of learning. Now let's look at our workplaces. Are we making them safe environments for them too? Sure, we're changing the way we clean and work, making them physically safe, but what about the social emotional impact of being the 16% of female engineers or the 6% of Latinx scientists. As we grapple with the glaring systematic racism laid bare by the pandemic, we have to take that same lens to STEM. As many of you may know, STEM can be hard. You need teachers and mentors to guide you and cheer you, support you, and when you feel like giving up. But what if none of these mentors look like you? What if you do go and end up making it into a STEM career, but when you get there, everyone around you is a white man? We've all heard the saying, if you can see it, you can be it. But what if you can't see it? 
if you never see a scientist that looks like you, it's harder to imagine yourself in such a career. Just as we work to address the economic and health impacts of the pandemic, we must provide our students with the academic, social, and emotional support to engage in learning. This is what we're doing at United Way, to keep kids interested and engaged in STEM, and we want to empower you to welcome and retain them once they get to you. And that's why today, we're going to spend some time talking about the importance of diversity and inclusion in STEM workplaces. And who better to have that conversation with than the 2021 STEM Excellence Corporate Award winners. The Corporate Leader of the Year Awards recognize companies that value and foster STEM education for youth, drive engagement within the community, and champion STEM careers. This year, we are so pleased to share this award with HubSpot and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, two companies who have been doing exemplary work to improve the diversity, equity, and inclusion within their organizations. But before we get into their work, I'd like to welcome Rob Fernandez to the screen. Rob is a member of the board of directors for our United Way. And he's also the Director of Environmental, Social, and Governance Research at Breckenridge Capital Advisors. Most recently, Rob and a colleague have been leading a discussion around using data to ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech sector. I can't think of anyone better to guide our conversation about this today than Rob. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Bob. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, as Bob mentioned, I work at Breckenridge. It's an investment management firm based here in Boston. For me personally and for Breckenridge's approach to investing, diversity and inclusion in the workplace is, is such an important topic. DNI represents a material risk to organizational and investment performance if a company is not pursuing a strategy for developing a more equitable, and inclusive workforce and culture. As noted in a recent Harvard Business Review article, and I quote, inequality is bad for both business and society. Organizations limit their capacity for innovation and continuous improvement unless all employees are full participants in the enterprise. And you know, speaking to the investment industry where I work, it has its own DNI challenges. Uh, for example, women only represent 18% of all certified financial analyst charter holders, which is a well-regarded industry credential. For the reasons that we've been talking about here today, as well as other considerations, Breckenridge and many firms across the investment management industry have embarked on their own DNI journeys. And now I'd like to ask a couple experts in the DNI field to join me on screen to help all of us better understand how we can support diversity and inclusion in, in our workplaces. So first I'd like to introduce Ildemaro Gonzalez. Hello Ildemaro, welcome. Hi Rob. So a little bit about Ildemaro. Uh, he brings 20 years of experience designing and implementing innovative DNI strategies to his role at Dana-Farber as Vice President and Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer. He works to align all aspects of the company's operations with DNI priorities, both domestically and globally. Previously, uh, Mr. Gonzalez has served as Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer at Parkland Health and Hospital System, Global Director of Inclusion and Philanthropy at Newell Rubbermaid, and Managing Director Diversity Strategy at the American Cancer Society National Home Office. And now I'd like to introduce Gabrielle Thomas, the other panelist here today. Hi, Gabby. Hi, Rob. Hey, Aldemar. Hi, Gabby. So Gabrielle Thomas is a diversity, inclusion, and belonging program manager at HubSpot, where she supports the product and engineering teams to create, plan, and execute on their DI and B programs, initiatives, and partnerships. Before joining HubSpot, 
uh, Gabby worked in education through both nonprofits and higher education where her passion for educational access was formed. And I wanted to invite all of you watching today to be part of the conversation. So please submit your questions and comments by pressing the ask a question button at the top of your screen. And so with that, we'd like to get the conversation started and um, have a first question ready to go. And Gabby, why don't you start? And so the question is, you know, how do you define diversity, equity, and inclusion? And why are you trying to diversify your workforce at HubSpot? So kind of a big higher level question to start with. Easy question, easy question. <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> All right, so on how we define it, right? I'll take it, those three words separately. So really for us, uh, diversity is focusing on the composition of the group. So who's within the organization on your team, really relational. Inclusion, we think of it as the quality of the experience and how it affects people to show up within your workplace. And then for us, equity, it's really focusing on the design of our systems and processes that we have in place that are helping to uphold our diversity and inclusion goals. So that's for us kind of frames what it is to us uh, and really why. As a company, we're super committed to our customers. And it's really important for us to build, we're a software company, so it's really important for us to build the best products that we can. And for us to do that, we really have to hire and retain the best people. And so for us to achieve that, we really have to make sure that we are focusing and implementing D, I, and B, or D, E, I goals within how we operate as a business. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Gabby. And Ildemaro, could you add, add on to that? You know, what does it look like at Dana-Farber and how do you define it? So along the same lines, one diversity is actually this, this mixture of perspectives that, that drive our everyday discovery and patient care. Again, when we talk about inclusion is, you know, is everyone able and, and uh, you know, has the environment to contribute to what we're after? And then equitable or equity is not equal. Again, is how do we ensure that everyone has the same access to both an experience and to both a patient experience and uh, the same type of health outcomes. Again, uh, it might some people might require some uh, support. Let's say uh, limited English proficiency patients might require, you know, um, interpretation or language services, while others don't. So, how do you actually accommodate what you're offering to ensure that everyone has uh, equitable outcomes? That's a little bit of how. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Ildemaro and Gabby. Um, you know, that's that's a great way to start. And then for kind of the next question here, and maybe Ildemaro, maybe you can continue and we'll go back to Gabby. Um, you know, what has been your approach at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute for diversifying your workforce? How are you doing it? And so what are some of the lessons you've learned uh, so far? So first we start with, again, a, a business case, right? So for us, it's ultimately to serve a growingly uh, diverse patient population by both understanding health and healthcare disparities, creating that patient experience that drives health, uh, positive health outcomes, and to maximize business results. You know, uh, our, our staff tell you there are plenty of uh, research out there, but our staff tell us that, you know, minority individuals experience a sense of isolation or a lack of community when they're the only or one of the few that look like them in the organization. Ultimately, for us, a diversified workforce, you know, impacts all bottom lines. So if you substitute, and because I know colleagues from different industries are, are watching this, you know, if, if you substitute the word patient for the applicable term in your industry, it is about you know, the benefit to your client or our consumer or your institution's growth agenda. That That's the way I see it. How, how are we going about it, Rob? We really have, you know, gone all the way down to in partnership, by the way, with uh, Boston Public Schools. We go all the way down from pipelines at ninth grade, right, to undergrad and graduate schools, um, adult and job specific training programs. But not only we seek to recruit, but also then once uh, underrepresented individuals are, you know, part of our team, then how do we ensure that they continue to grow? So again, um, 
couple of things we do there. And we do host Boston students uh, for a day of tech here. We host uh, you know, a variety through our workforce development programs. We host about 60 students a year from high schools, again, within a mile of our school. Um, undergrads partnering again as i said with Boston public schools administrative internship programs we even um or we also have a program that brings together minority individuals entering hms or harvard medical school of medicine brings them together over the summer again to provide this sense of community and support group that is so re that is required you know to to move forward and be successful in med school so our approach is simple we start at the uh in ninth grade and we go all the way through grad school and then once they're in simple but not easy so the, the work is is uh, harder to do than than harder to plan ultimately what you want to make sure is that you have intention Th this work requires intentionality and requires meeting again the the candidates where they're at that's great thank you Odomaro. that's very helpful and gabby yeah the you know the same question for you how are you diversifying your workforce at hubspot and what are some of the things and some of the lessons you've learned along the way? Yeah, so I will start by saying our really main guiding principle is that we don't just walk the walk, we talk the talk. Uh, so when we think about what does it mean to make an impact on your workforce? And for us, we're also thinking about our customers as well as our partners within our ecosystem. So we have like three different groups that we're thinking about diversifying and almost actually serving. And so really important for us is that we measure our progress. If you don't measure, you probably don't care about it. So if we think about what we actually want to accomplish, we have to make sure we measure it so we can hold ourselves accountable. So for us, that includes external, externally publishing our diversity reports. We've been doing that since 2017. Um, so we're really being transparent about the progress we've been making over the years. The next thing for us is really making sure that we incorporate DIMB practices into everything that we do. So that is how we hire, that is how we performance manage, the orgs that we partner with. Um, you know, so pretty much like all of those parts of the flywheel uh, is really part of how we think about diversifying that workforce. And then also thinking about how we actually iterate what we're doing based on our feedback and goals. So, you know, it's really simple for us to say, yes, we're making sure that we are incorporating DIND practices, equitable practices into how we recruit, how we source candidates. Um, but we're also thinking about when someone steps into the building or into the workplace, what is their experience going to be like? Because there's one thing about focusing on the diversity or diversifying the workforce, but if you are recruiting, but you aren't retaining at the same time, then it's it's kind of, there's no reason to be doing it, right? So when we think about some of the lessons that we've really learned from over the years is really creating a balance between checking the box, but then creating guardrails. So if we focus too much on the data, uh, then you can feel like you're studying too much for the test and not really focusing on creating true systemic change. And the other thing for us is really focusing on that order of operation. So again, too much placing an emphasis on what the workforce looks like is not going to help you when you're thinking about creating an if there is an unequal balance in their experience. So again, focusing not only on the diversity, but the equity and inclusion of what it means for someone when they actually are part of your workplace. And then lastly for us, one of the other big lessons is on global programming. You know, we are a global company in a couple of different countries and making sure that it's not a simple, it's not a simple copy and paste for us. And we're still learning about what that means to have DIB initiatives, efforts in another country versus in America where, where I am right now. Um, it's not as simple, again, as copy and paste, but really thinking about how you adjust your strategies for different markets for whatever business you're in. That goes the same for DIMB efforts. Oh, that's really that's really interesting. And maybe I can ask you a, um, a follow-up question, Gabby. You touched on measuring and goal setting. Um, we, we You see other companies that will publish uh, diversity and inclusion metrics and and discussion around their strategy and maybe some companies set will set DNI goals but others don't it sounds like HubSpot you you measure as well as 
and you've also set goals for yourself. What kind, what what benefits do you see come from that as far as setting a DNI goal and measuring measuring the progress towards that goal? For sure. So the setting the goal, it really helps to create a, a North Star for the whole company. Um, from different org orgs, again, I work with product and engineering more specifically, but we have sales, we have uh, marketing, we have finance, we have legal. So really it helps to gather everyone around a bigger cause if we know where we're trying, where we're headed. Um, in regards to what benefits that comes from, that allows us to, one, if you're just starting out, set a baseline, get an understanding of what it is that you're doing, um, but also being aspirational and where you want to be in a year's time, five years time. That has helped us to really understand and kind of like package how successful have we seen our efforts? And again, there's like a difference between goals and quotas, not talking about quotas, because again, that's really box checking, but understanding where do we want to be and setting a vision that's been really helpful for us over the past couple of years as we almost solidified really what does it mean for HubSpot as a software company in the tech industry to really create scalable and impact impactable change on our DIMB goals, but also really for tech. It's it's almost like we're doing it for ourselves, but we're also doing it for the entire industry at the same time. Oh, that makes sense. That's great. Yeah. Rob, let me let me add on to Gabby's piece. Yeah. A couple of things that you know, that aspect of the not having this the cut and paste approach across the world. It it also and, and having done it globally, it also it actually applies uh, domestically and it applies in our organization. And that's why when we talk about the business case or why we do this, we want to make sure that we're setting goals around our research aspects, right? What are we doing in cancer disparities research? And what are we doing to increase minority representation in business in, in clinical trials? When we think of our patients, right? Uh, how are we enhancing or how we can actually measure the difference in experience for our minority or diverse patients uh, versus non-diverse non patients? When we think of of our staff, right? We think around uh, difference in gaps in turnover rates. We think, of course, in, in you know minority representation in assessments and all the most the, the usual suspects. And then in community, we certainly look at you know conversion rates and our pipeline programs from community to full time employment and, and underserving and underserving. Um, uh, and caring for the underserved for the medically underserved. Now we've tied. Not only we set the goals, we tie them to executive compensation. And for us, what that means is that it enables individuals to see their part in it. It enables individuals to understand, even when I'm not hiring someone every day, but if I'm analyzing data, if I'm, anal if I'm analyzing safety incidents, you know, what is this equity lens that I can apply? And it helps people then um, be galvanized around what the organization is trying to achieve with the inclusion diversity and equity initiatives. Thank you, Ildemar. That's a great perspective. And we have a question, a couple of questions from the audience, which is great. And please send more, uh, those of you who are watching. Um, Ildemar, maybe you can start with, with this. And then, Gabby, there's a separate question that um, I could pose to you. But, but uh, Ildemar, you know, what has been the hardest part of your DEI journey so far? And how are you working to over overcome the challenges that you've, uh, you know, you've, you've seen and faced? Let me summarize, I guess, my experience in 20 years. I believe the hardest part of it is helping people, it was my previous point, helping people truly understand the connection between what they do on a daily basis and how, and inclusion, diversity, and equity. So most people tend to think this is about the hiring process. And it's really, you know, less common than to understand, hmm, you know, safety incidents. When you look at limited English proficiency patients, they tend to be around care coordination versus for everyone else. It's about fluid and, and medication. So what what does that mean for me as a safety analyst? And so on and so forth. So in my mind, that's the hardest part that then it brings about efforts around un helping the organization understand inclusion, diversity, and equity is beyond what my force, what my workforce looks like, and creating a plan or a strategy that actually impacts 
all aspects of the organization. In my mind, that's hardest. Once the line is clear, once people understand, oh, all right, why is it that we need minority patients in trials? So, oh, so the results are actually applicable across all populations. Then I drive, I, I get on the bus to, to say it in, in one way, and then I'm all in favor. That to me has been the hardest part of the overall strategy. Okay, great, thank you. And, and Gabby, um, you mentioned a little earlier uh, practices in hiring and managing. Um, do you have any spe uh, specific examples of what that looks like in practice? This yeah, from so the audience. When, yeah. When we think about equitable hiring practices, um, sourcing comes up a lot. So basically, how you are finding your candidates. Now, one of the uh, sort of obstacles that maybe companies will face when they um, are trying to diversify their workforce, they'll lean on, oh, but the, the pipeline isn't that diverse. Um, the talent pool just doesn't have the people that we're looking for. And that's usually not true um, based on sourcing. So how you go about looking for candidates that you want to consider. Um, we've done a lot of work with that in our own recruitment department and thinking about really focusing on the specific attributes of what you want this person to bring to that role. So not focusing on where they went to school, um, where they worked before your particular company, that stuff doesn't really matter as long as they have the attributes, right? So that's one of the parts of equitable hiring, thinking about sourcing. So that's you know one of our big focuses for us. And then when thinking about performance um, management, so as you move to diversifying your workforce, especially if it's always it already homogenous, um, there may be certain management styles that are more prevalent because maybe the people there were very similar to each other. Um, so as you think about diversifying your workforce, you're gonna be bringing in people with different perspectives, different experiences. Maybe those people, and in thinking about tech specifically, didn't come from a computer science background. Maybe they didn't study this in college. And so they didn't have these specific internships that people usually have. And so they just come with a different set of experiences before they come to your door. How do you actually think about bridging that gap in, maybe it's not a gap, but just a disconnect of, this is what I'm used to. How do I actually have the resources for me as a manager to provide you with the, the space, the opportunity for you to to not only grow, but thrive within this company. So um, how we train our managers is super important and under, like giving them the resources to really find that balance on management style, um, but also making sure that, and Eldemaro kind of talked about this earlier, in how do we actually hold our leaders, managers accountable for showing up in this these instances? So um, that's a big part for us, making sure that as part of performance management of our leaders and managers is that we're making sure that they're also committing to impacting, helping us meet our DIMB goals. Now, what that looks like for your company will be a little different, but that's for us on hiring and performance management, how that actually comes into play. Oh, so, um, Gabby alluded, uh, let me add here, Gabby alluded earlier to data, right? And although it's, I think, and, you know, correctly said, it's not about the data, it's also about the experience. This is a, in recruitment itself, because uh, we got that question specifically. It's really important to start with data in terms of, is it a lack of candidates? Is it, is it really that you're not, you know, bringing the candidates into your application process? That could be the case, or is it that even when they show up at the application level, then they're not moved to the first or second interview or final stages. So analyzing your funnel and understanding will enable you to create different strategies. So for example, if it is around not having a diverse applicant pool, then pipeline programs, we have our, our pharmacy tech pipeline program, we bring people from the community, minority individuals, we train them to be uh, pharmacy techs, we, through a partnership with JBS, by the way, we then um, you know support them in taking their license and hiring them. If it is about, even though they show up, the application process are not moving to the next level. So now we've instituted um, panel interviews. We're moving away and we're recommending to move away from individual interviews into panel interviews because they're mitigating uh, biases you, as, as you go in through the process. All right, we train our panels in, in short bias training right on time, right before. So all these are 
are things, by the way, I in no way want to say we, we solve this, that we are learning, we're trying some things, some things are working, some are not. But And, and then uh, when people think about diversifying, if you look at your organization, everyone's organization is more diverse at the bottom of the pyramid or at the entry, or early career roles, right? So the, the really the pipeline in terms of external pipelines and internships, they're not going to help you diversify your vice president and above. So at that point, many, many times you use search firms. So what are you requesting of the search firms? How could, how in the language, in the context, contract language, how are you stating, right, your inclusion, diversity, and equity commitment? So some of these are specific uh, thoughts that you would, you know, think of as, as you were thinking of recruitment. Yeah, I think the big thing with data and recruiting is like understanding what question you're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. Because you can get, <laughs> you can move left, right with the data, depending on how you're thinking about it, but really understanding what you're trying to answer is going to be super important for any of so if you have a people analytics team, lean on them. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's really fascinating. And Gabby, could you also touch on um, the question about the, the biggest challenges that you've faced so far in pursuing DEI, you know, strategy at HubSpot and how you've overcome those, those uh, challenges or trying to overcome them? Yes. So I feel like I joined this work at a really great time. They had already set up a lot of the foundation. Uh, Again, we had already incorporated DIMB goals within our business goals as a company. So for me, it's been like, there's less, I'll be honest, less um, trying to help people understand what we're trying to do. Like we've already got that really clear that's embedded in how the leaders show up and again, how their team show up. For me and what we're really working through right now, more specifically, so, our product and engineering teams are both in North America and in Europe. And so, as I kind of talked about a little bit earlier, global DIMB, that's really the big thing that we're trying to work through. Have we solved it? No, but we are working on it. Uh, so for us, it's really understanding, well, we've had a really North America centric approach. And um, I think that we've kind of thought about, again, that copy and pasting and just saying, okay, for our Singapore office, this is what we're doing. Um, for our uh, Bogota office, here's what we're doing. And that that doesn't work. And so really for us is understanding and trying to get more cultural understanding of what is DIMB and the requests that we are making or the expectations that we are setting for our managers, our individual contributors, leaders in each of those regions. And like, does it actually work? Right. So almost Ildemaro said it earlier, meeting people where they're at. We're really trying to understand while one hoping and making progress on our overall business goals around DIB, but how do we actually maybe pivot a little, flex it a little bit here or translated in a different way that it actually makes sense regionally. So that's a really big one for us. Um, and that's really important for us as we really scale up our efforts because, you know, we can't boil the ocean here. We have to really make sure that we <laughs> right. think about the things that are going to make sense and actually scale and work in the future. That's great. Thank you, Gabby. And I was just looking at the time and I think we have about a couple more minutes, maybe for one more question. So, um, I thought we could uh, conclude with, you know, maybe Gabby, you go first and then Il tomorrow about a minute each or so, just speaking to the advice that you would have for other companies in, in how they're developing and how they could develop their own inclusive and equitable workplace culture. You know, maybe a couple points there and some advice you could offer. Yeah, so really quickly, I think making sure that you treat your DIMB initiatives as business critical and not add on programs, that's the only way you're gonna really see impact. And that means that you are providing monetary investment, people investment, time, um, all of that. So make sure you approach this as a business critical, you know, problem or opportunity. The next I would say, especially as you think about equity is really focusing on inclusive design as you approach these problems. So one of the big things that tends to happen is if you are trying to change a system or process and the people who are part of that decision-making group are not reflective of the group in its whole that is going to be receiving uh, the change, then 
that's not helpful. So making sure that there is representation also within as we you know, really make try to make impact on these inclusive uh, design system processes, that's going to be super important. That's great. Thank you, Gabby. And Ildemaro? So I'm going to pay back on something Gabby said earlier, which is one, don't try to boil the ocean, right? Focus on a few things that are well-defined that you can measure. Focus on those two or three, four key priorities, year one, and measure and then gain on, on, on your success. That's, that's one. Two, when you think about your strategy, again, align to your overall strategic priorities. This is not about a separate, what is your organization's inclusion diversity plan and what's your organization's business plan? It's a business plan, it's a business plan, a single one through the lens of inclusion, diversity and equity. How can you, uh, you know, further accomplish your, your vision? Which then brings me a point to metrics and while you define isolated metrics, you want to use a single organizational scorecard. So the metrics that you are already using, how do you then look at them through an inclusion, diversity, and equity lens? Meaning if you're measuring market share, then all right, what am I gaining in minority markets? Because by the way, minority markets are the ones that are growing. So is it so it's not about creating a separate plan or a separate set of metrics that you track because inevitably people will think that that's outside their work. So how do you weave it across everything you do is, is or weaving it across everything you do is my advice. That's great. Thank you, Odomaro. You know, a half an hour is never enough for a topic like this, but it's always important to get this conversation started. And I hope you will all join me and keeping the momentum going. So thank you, Ildemaro and Gabby for joining me today. And thank you to our audience for being a part of today's discussion. When we all work together, change is possible. And that's why United Way has brought us all together today. Isn't that right, Bob? Thank you, Rob. It is indeed. Your times like this demand unity. United Way is honored to make it possible for our constituents and stakeholders to hear from leaders like yourself and our panelists who are leading on these issues and efforts each and every day. So Rob, Gabby, Ildemaro, we know you are incredibly busy working to bring the STEM community together, and we appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us and with our audience today. And I wanna take this opportunity to share my gratitude to each and every one of you that joined for this critical conversation. We also wanna thank our sponsors and our Boston partners. If you are inspired today and would like to stay engaged and connected, please do. You can take a moment and invest in equity by clicking that donate button at the top of your screen. You can sign up for our newsletters and volunteer opportunities by responding to the thank you email that will come your way. And you can join us as we continue the conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our next United for Justice webinar on June 9th, which will focus on our LGBTQ plus community. Until then, I wish you a great day, a great week, and great health. Thank you. <laughs>